Hey, welcome to the channel of Birdtalk Austria. My name is Fred Kreusenbrunner. I'm from Austria. I'm the pilot of a Cessna Lima 19er Oscar 1 Birdtalk. This is my baby. It's a 1953 Birdtalk, an A model that flew for the United States Army. My dad flew the Birdtalk for more than 20 years in the Austrian Army and he collected more than 5,500 hours. Luckily, he was my instructor. Thanks, Dad. I'm also a member and safety director of the International Bird Dog Association. Our mission is to keep the stories of the pilot that flew the bird dog in combat alive. This series here now is called Cessna Oscar 1 Lima 19er Bird Dog Legends over Vietnam. We want to keep your stories alive for the next generation. Thank you for your service. Gentlemen, this time I have the honor to present you Captain Francis Eugene Alexander, a bird dog pilot who flew as Shotgun 21 in Vietnam. Gene, it's an honor to have you here on my channel. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, thank you. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm really pleased at what you're doing, uh, bring, uh, keeping the, the stories about Vietnam alive. Yeah. and about the use of the bird dog in, in, in any capacity. So. Absolutely. Your story has to be told, and uh, it's amazing that you do this. Very Thank you very much. Uh, Gene, can you, can you introduce yourself? Well, my, my name is Francis Alexander. I go by the name Gene because my middle name is Eugene. I'm a mechanical engineer. I live in Oregon in the United States. I'm retired now. I'm 76 years old. And um, I've had a long engineering career, which was quite successful. Gene, what connected you with aviation in those days? I, I loved aviation in, every, in, in all, its, all its capacity. And I have been that way since I was very small. My father um, was a Navy officer. He joined... Uh, the uh, Navy right out of uh, high school and went to uh, it's called Midshipman School where he was commissioned as an ensign. When he was a, a young man, he had uh, he loved aviation and thought that the F4U Corsair was the only real airplane ever built. And uh, he had wanted to fly and he had these pictures that were taken out of flying magazines, just papering his, his, uh, his bedroom. So after midshipman school, he had orders to go to uh, Navy flight school, but then the war in Europe ended. And as soon as it did, the Navy canceled all orders to fly flight train. So they made him a bomb disposal officer or trained him as that. And he served until the end of the war and then they let him out. But he was, since he was a reserve officer, he retained his commission. And when Korea happened in 1950, he was called back up to active duty and then sent to Korea and served aboard an escort uh, aircraft carrier called a Jeep carrier as an engineering officer, uh, rubbing elbows with those other pilots that were uh, on the air, on a ship with him, I'm, I'm sure it must have been a very uh, difficult for him to to know that he he missed being a pilot just by a few months. Had he been just a couple months older, he would have he would have been a pilot like the rest of them. But anyway, as he had uh, after Korea, he came home and we he had uh, three children at the time. I was the second oldest. I had an older brother and a younger sister. And as, as poor as we were, he always found uh, time to, on, uh, coming home from work, to maybe possibly stop at a shop and buy a little model airplane to bring home so that uh, he, little, at that time they were little balsa airplanes. And uh, he and I and my brother would sit at the kitchen table and build these planes. So he retained his love of flying all through his life. 
And uh, so as I grew up uh, in high school, I, I continued to build model airplanes, mostly plastic. And then I got into make, uh, flying a, a control line uh, models with 049 engines on them. And uh, along when I graduated from high school in 1966 from a school near Portland, Oregon, the Vietnam War was gone and the draft was happening and my selective service designation was 1A, which meant as soon as I graduated from high school, I was going to be inducted or drafted. So I went to the recruiter and simply asked him, give me anything that is related to aviation. So he found a school called Aircraft Engine Repair School. So in September 66, I left Portland after graduating high school, went to basic training in Fort Polk, Louisiana, and then went straight to Fort Eustis, Virginia, which is near Norfolk, okay. and went through uh, airplane engine repair school. And I did well. And during during the school, I realized I, I think I would much rather fly these things than work on the engines. And I had discovered that if I had be, if I could become a commissioned officer, then I would be able to apply to go to flight school as a commissioned officer. And so uh, I applied to go to OCS, Officer Candidate School, mm -hmm. and was accepted. And in the time between the end of the, air, of the engine school and the OCS, I, they found time to send me to leadership school for four, four weeks. And then I finally ended up in, uh, off, in Fort Benning, Georgia. I think it was in, uh, the, it must have been April 67. So six months later, seven months actually, I was commissioned, uh, graduated in November of 67, commissioned as a second lieutenant in an infantry. And uh, immediately after graduating and being commissioned, I went home, married my uh, my childhood sweetheart. You know, you know, and this November, we will be married 57 years. Hey, well. And uh, so anyway, she's a keeper. And uh, so after a short time as a training officer, I finally got orders to go to flight school. The first two phases, there's four phases, A, through A, B, C, and D. And A and B phases are done at Fort Stewart, Georgia. And A and B phases are there. And both A and B phases are flown in what the airplane, uh, the Army called a T-41B. Mm -hmm. And it was... Uh, it was basically the same as a Hawk XP now. Uh, a 172 XP has a six-cylinder Continental uh, engine with a constant speed prop, 210 horsepower, I think. So A phase was basically the equivalent of going and taking a private pilot's course. Mm -hmm. Once B phase and, and A phase, by the way, they were, those were taught by uh, civilian, contract civilian pilots by oh. a company called Ross Aviation. And my instructor had been an Air Force B-52 pilot. Oh. And, then, so, <laughs> and his name was Carver, I, Lloyd Carver, great guy. And, uh, and B phase, the instructors were uh, Department of Army civilians. And my instructor there was a Mr. Haynes and he had been a B-24 pilot in the Second World War, and had been oh. shut down over Germany and spent uh, several months in a prison, prisoner of war camp before the end of the, of the war. Okay. He, was, he was very strict. So B phase is equivalent of going and having a commercial pilot's license. And the whole course was very intense. It was uh, every day we were at the airfield, half the day, and at uh, classroom training the other half but after that it was intensive training for two months uh, and then uh, we transferred over to Fort uh, Rucker Alabama and we transitioned into multi-engine aircraft this was a beach b-55 Baron 
and they, the Army called it a T-42. Mm-hmm. Once we uh, uh, graduated from C phase, then we started D phase and were introduced to the bird dog. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know I one of the things that you ask about is ground looping the airplane. I remember I ground looped the airplane trying to get it out of the parking spot. The <laughs> because all the bird dogs were just parked in a field and the field was very bumpy. You would just had a grassy field. And I must have been in a, the, the, the gear was in a hole or something and I tried to taxi it out and gave it too much power and too much rudder and just spun it around in a circle. And I think the instructor had something, uh, something interesting to say about that, but that was my only That's ground cool. loop in my, my whole my whole uh, career. So uh, we taxied off and took off. And suddenly I have a stick in my right hand instead of a yoke in my left hand. And it felt like I had, I was getting into a whole new realm of flying. I, uh, but at the end of that flight, that first flight, it felt like flying with a stick was the only real way to flying airplane. Yeah. And I, so I loved it after that. The worst incident that we had during the the, uh, training in the bird dog which we would we were doing at a stage field that had two parallel uh, parallel runways and it had a uh, power line running along parallel with one of the the left runway and uh, one of the students came down he had too much flaps and this was these were approaches over a barrier he hit very hard, and the nose, it just bounced the nose straight up. And, he, and still with the flash down, he got it full throttle. And the P factor, the P, uh, P factor asymmetrical loading just drug him around uh, to the left, oh. but still kept, kept the airplane's nose up. He flew underneath the power wires and then clipped the tree with his left wing and cartwheeled into the tree. Oh. And it, and the actual the bird actually stuck in the tree. It didn't come all the way down. And the bird wasn't damaged that much, but eventually they had to use ropes to lower the two pilots down to the ground because the aircraft was still stuck in there. So it was then you learned how to you you learned how to do lap a nap of the earth navigation. Um using uh, rockets, uh, adjusting artillery fire, every uh, message dropping, everything you can possibly do with an airplane, uh, we were doing in the bird dog. And so at the end of end of training, I felt that I was ready to go uh, and be a, a bird dog pilot in Vietnam, even though I think I only had about 210 flying hours. Mm-hmm. And I learned very quickly once I got to Vietnam that I was not ready. That, yeah, okay. uh, there was many things I should I I needed to learn. It's it's a miracle that I got through the first four months of, of flying over there. Did you have special flap sixty training? I uh, I developed a, a a procedure that I used since. In Vietnam, I was flying out of a an improved 2,000 foot strip when I left and came back. But during the day, I was landing at unimproved grass strips, and most of them were very short. And so, what I I learned to use flap uh, flap 60 never uh, on the approach. I I never felt that I needed to slow the airplane down so much. That uh, so I use a maximum of 40. And if I wanted to stop very fast, or I had a a, air, a, a runway condition that was slick, then as I as I rounded out to flare the airplane, my left hand was on the throttle quadrant, and my fingers around the throttle back to idle, and at the same time push the flap switched down, which was right under the palm of my left hand. So as I I rotated, pulled the throttle off, rotated, and pushed the flap switch down to 60. 
-hmm. When that happens, the airplane absolutely stops flying and mm -hmm. all of its weight is on the gear. So you can stand on the brakes and get good, uh, very good traction. Uh, but I don't recall ever coming down final, a short final, with more than 40, 40 degrees. But I used 60 a lot, but it was just to get the airplane stopped and get it to stop flying so that it was planted heavily on the ground. And, and then uh, I was able to stop it very quickly. You, know, you, you had the, electric flaps. You had no manual flaps, huh? We had electric flaps. Yeah, okay, and uh, your landing technique uh, also was three-point, or did you do also yeah. wheel landings? No, we never did wheel landings. We never taught, they never taught wheel landings in school. I think it was a case of where they, they, uh, they did a lot of ground looping and trying to land the airplane. Since it has a very flexible gear, it tends to want to bounce yeah. up and down, and you get behind the bouncing, <laughs> yeah. you know, the bouncing is causing forward movements of your hand a little bit. So you're you're porpoising down the runway. So we landed in three point and plopped the airplane on the ground and make sure that it was totally done flying and using flap 60 uh, in that technique worked fine. And if you look at the uh, at the performance you don't really get any more lift between 40 and 60 degrees. All you get is more drag. Yeah. And when, when the airplane is in its three-point position, to, you know, the, the angle of attack to the relative wind, when your the tail is down, you have uh, a lot of flaps. The line between the leading edge of the, air, of the wing and the tail of the flaps is greater than the critical angle of attack on the aircraft. So by definition, at that angle of attack, the wing is stalled. Mm. So if you're if you hit the ground and the flaps are down to 60, the inside half of the wing is totally stalled. It cannot be flying with that much angle of attack. And and so all you're getting is the drag and since you're not getting any lift from the inside of the wing, that means all of the weight most of the weight of the airplane is on the wheels and you're not going to skid them as much if, as if you if you landed and lifted the flaps immediately, especially if you had a slick surface, if you lifted the flaps, the airplane, the wing is partially flying again and that unloads the wheels. You step on the brakes and you just skid. Uh, okay, uh, so you left uh, for Drake, Alabama with about 210 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think then you had one month or four weeks uh, time to stay at home. Yeah, it was. We got out of flight school on the 19th of uh, January, and I was home for what five weeks mm -hmm. or four, uh, four or five weeks and left for Vietnam on the 24th of February, which was four days after I turned 21 years old. So when I oh. landed in Vietnam, I just just to turn 21. Okay. How was it to come to Vietnam? Well, you know, we live in the Pacific Northwest. And in February, there was, when I left, there was six inches of snow on the ground. It was raining. Uh, it was about uh, 30, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. It was a very blustery, nasty place. And I get off the airplane and at uh, Vietnam, and the first thing you get is the the heat and humidity and the smell. And uh, so it was a rude awakening. People describe the smell in various ways. To me, it wasn't that uh, obsessive, but it's something that after you've been there for a month, you don't even notice it, and you just get on with doing your job. And when we landed, uh, we went to a replacement facility and uh, they chose to put you where they needed you the most. But the uh, Army had a policy that if you had a relative in Vietnam, that you could request to go to where he was. Well, my older brother, Roger, was already in Vietnam. He had been there a year. And he had extended 
for another three months because he knew I was coming. And we hadn't seen each other in a couple of years because of all the training. And so I requested to go to Kanto. His, he was a, a machinist in an engineer battalion located on the Kanto air, airfield. So I requested to go there and they obliged me by giving me an assignment to the 20, 221st because they knew evidently that the 221st had a platoon located at the Kanto airfield. So that, that satisfied the requirement of me being able to go to where I wanted to go. So that's how I ended up being in the 221st. And uh, so Dave, Dave and I actually flew down to Sok Trang from, from Saigon in the same plane and landed and reported to the CO of the 221st. Okay. When you get there, they don't immediately just give you an airplane and say, go out there and do your job. You're expected to get an in-country checkout with some uh, one of the pilots or one or two of the pilots that are, are uh, at the, what they call the headquarters uh, platoon, guys who are like the, the executive officer and the supply officer and the personnel officer and so off. They have a staff of, of, of officers in, in the headquarters that are also pilots. And most of those guys spend their time instructing brand new uh, replacement pilots that are coming in. So after a okay. week, they they gave you the time uh, to to really arrive in in Vietnam to to, yes. to come down and and to get the feeling. Yes, it was about okay. a week. A week, okay. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, David told me that uh, in Fort Rock, Alabama, they they didn't really tell you how to shoot the rockets. Uh, I think David. Where? David told me he shot uh, two or three rockets. That's it, or one rocket. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I think two. We were allowed two rockets. And uh, but I don't inspectors... understand this because the main <laughs> mission, the main mission of the bird dog is to, is to shoot the rockets. And in flight well, school, you were only allowed to shoot two rockets. Well, rockets are expensive. Uh, I guess they they're being a little frugal, and uh, but. <laughs> You know, it's not that big of a deal. The uh, there was no sighting mechanism. All you had, I I took a grease pencil and made a, a circle about that big on the windshield, and it was basically where I sat in the airplane. After shooting it, I would adjust where that circle was, so I knew if I put that 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 circle on the target and I was at a certain angle, and the airplane was in trim not skidding or slipping, that if the rocket was a good one, and then it would go pretty much in that direction. So uh, the hardest thing was sh getting to shoot the rocket before you exceeded the maximum airspeed that you wanted to do in, in the dive, and then glancing at the turn and slip indicator and make sure that you're not skidding or slipping mm -hmm. because the airplane if it's going sideways, the rocket will come out and it will streamline into the relative wind and you will miss one, one way or the other. And uh, the other thing is we carried uh, four rockets on each wing and they were either in a straight line using both bomb shackles on the same wing or you use one shackle and had a, the rockets in a, in a square pad. Yeah. And uh, I remember one day I was, I had an electrical problem on my airplane in Vietnam and, and I, I select, I, there's a selector, uh, selector panel above, I think it was on this. Oh, the rockets, yeah. Remember, one, one side or the other, I selected. Yeah, you selected, see it. You see my, so it's, oh yeah, yeah, I can yeah. see it. But anyway, I selected a rocket and I rolled in and I pulled the trigger and nothing happened. So I rolled, I came back out and came around again and I selected another rocket, dove and nothing happened. And so I did it a third time. And what I should have done is shut off the other two that didn't go. I should have shut them both, but I forgot. So now I had three rockets armed. And when I pulled the trigger, all three of them came out at the same time, <laughs> uh, 
Well, they're, when they're side by side and they come out at exactly the same time, the fins can inter get bound up in each other because the fins pop out as soon as they come out of the tube. And so in this case, it bent the fins. One of the rockets did big corkscrew like this all the way down to the target. One went actually straight to the target. One turned and went straight down underneath the airplane. Just did a big, wild turn and went straight down. Needless to say, that taught, that taught me something. I never to have tried to shoot two rockets from adjoining tubes at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but uh, I remember that shooting the rockets in Viet or in, in flight training was only one day, one flight. You had two rockets. Uh, this instructor said, okay, dive in and do this and this and this. And I, I rolled in and he had told me that I was not to pull the trigger until he told me to, that he confirmed that I was pointed in the right direction. Well, I forgot about that. And when I rolled in and thought that I had aimed at the target, I pulled the trigger and off it went. And I remember if I hit anything, but I remember him being quite angry that, that, uh, I didn't wait for him to give me the signal to go ahead and fire. But uh, well, shooting rockets just became second nature. It's quite difficult to hit a target, say, the size of a house from 1,500 feet. And, you know, when, when you're shooting just smoke or white phosphorus, and all you intend to do is to put a point on the ground where you can get a, a reference from that point to where you want the guy to put his bombs or rock his you know uh, a gunship or a jet. So you you have a point on the ground and you say okay from the smoke 50 meters right at at 50. So it's really not necessary for you hit to hit the target. But when you're shooting HE and you're shooting at a specific target, then you need to be able to hit it and. Uh, from 1,500 feet, if you start your, say, you start your rocket run or your attack at 1,500 and you launch, at, uh, say, 1,000 feet, that means you're almost, you know, 1,800 feet diagonal distance to the ground. And these rockets are not guided. They're just going to go up and uh, where you're pointed. And if you miss by 25 meters, you might, have not, might as well not have shot uh, because... You know, the, the warheads, uh, the, the HE warheads that we use were 17 pounders. They had either point detonating fuses or VT fuses, variable time fuses. And they're roughly the same explosive uh, and kill capability as a 105 millimeter howitzer shell. So they're quite powerful, especially if they detonate in the air. So the shrapnel was coming out horizontally in, in kind of a cone shape as it goes, goes forward, it spreads out. And uh, so their VT fuses are much better for troops in the open. If you're shooting at somebody open or just hiding behind trees. But if you have to blow up something that is hardened target, like a bunker, then you choose a point detonating warhead <laughs> and it will penetrate a little bit further before it detonates and, and is much more effective against a hard target. Uh, you sent me a picture of your bird dog. So yeah, that's one. You told yeah. me that uh, in the middle you had two rockets with radar. Yeah, those those little white domes on the front of the war the, the, or the fuse, and those are called the VT Victor Tango, or, or what's Army calls variable time, and they are designed to detonate four to twenty feet above the ground. Now the other, I can't see what the other rockets are in the outer tubes, but I think those are flechette rounds. And they don't even ever hit the ground. They detonate in the air uh, when the rocket motor burns out. Okay. Uh, so this was uh, a G model, is that correct? No, this is a Delta model. A D model, okay. See, so it has a constant speed prop on it. Mm -hmm. This airplane had, I think, 8,000 hours on it when they gave it to me to fly. Wow, okay. And uh, so it was well used. If you look closely at the various shades of OD paint, you'll see that there's, there are 
there are several different shades. They're subtle, but you can tell. And that means that it had parts of the other airplanes attached uh, on it. But, uh, but that was my baby. That was the first airplane they gave me and I had it through the entire time. And I think I went through three engines in, in the time that I had it. <laughs> This this photograph was taken at Chi Lang, uh, near in the Seven Mountains area. And the if you look straight over top of the airplane, down into the corner of the ramp, that's the that's where the 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 B team that I supported was located. And we lived with them. So I had I commanded this section of aircraft, three aircraft, and by the end of the year I had uh, th uh, three pilots. The other two pilots were warrant officers, and we uh, each flew the airplane, the same airplane all the time. And it, it didn't have our name written anywhere on it. So if if this airplane needed maintenance and I needed to fly a mission, I could always take one of the others. All you wanted to go up to do is just fly around in an area for a long time and do a visual reconnaissance, you could throttle back significantly and pull the RPM back and you could get four hours uh, of, of time before you needed to refuel. Uh, Gene, uh, can you describe a normal mission? How did this look like? From Who, who gave you the orders? Uh, tell me the procedure. Okay. Uh, when I first was assigned to uh, the second platoon and sent to uh, Canto, the second platoon had two pilots that flew exclusively for a special forces unit there. Now the fifth special forces group, which uh, had a, a what's called a C team or Charlie team at located actually right on the uh, Canto airfield. It was called C4. And they were responsible basically for uh, work in the entire Mekong Delta. C4 had five B teams that belonged to it, Bravo teams, B41, 42, 43, and so forth. And they were scattered out on right and close to the where the headquarters of the B team were scattered, scattered out along the, the Cambodia Vietnam border all the way from Han, from uh, Ha Tien in the west, which is the very most western point of Vietnam, if you don't include Phu Quoc Island. And so the border went from Ha Tien all the way to a place called the Parrot's Peak, which is just west of, of uh, Saigon. All right, so the entire distance that was separated into five areas, geographical areas, and each one of those areas had a B team. Within the B team were A teams. An A team might have only 12 or 15 Americans in it, and they were located literally right on the border. And B, when I got, so when I got to Canto, the two, uh, pilots that were assigned to fly for C4 were getting short. Both of them were in infantry branch office uh, captains. And so I was, since I was infantry, I was assigned to take the place of one of those two guys. And so I moved in with them and the captain, uh, I think Captain Young was the one that was leaving. So he took me under his wing and he started flying with me in the area of operation that I would be taking over. And uh, all of, at that time, it was anywhere along the entire border, like I say, from Pontian to the Paris Peak, which is a distance of about um, 200, 200 miles or so. And uh, generally at that time, uh, he was just training me, taking me into all the airstrips that I would go need to go into, showing me where not to fly, how not to approach an area, where most of the ground fire would I would get if I flew over it. And uh, 
taught me the ropes. He also flew me out to Fuquak Island because we had an A team out there as well. And so going into Fuquak, uh, Fuquak to, meant, meant flying out across the ocean for about 70 miles and landing at Fuquak has is an island that's about 35 miles long and showed me where to land there uh, and uh, met the people that I would be working with once he left. So he, he bas basically showed me the ropes for about a week and then he left and I took over. Well, it so happened that uh, the guy, there was a, a, a light colonel who was stationed on the island and he was the, uh, on Fukuoka Island, and he was the assistant to the commandant of a prisoner of war camp on the island that had, at that time, 19,000 prisoners. Well, that, that colonel uh, must have known somebody at G4 because he wanted an airplane to play with. And so, the, so I was assigned to fly for him a while just to uh, basically get my feet wet. So I flew out there and landed at Antoy. It was a very nice airfield. It had about, well, must have been 4,000 feet of, of Marsden matting uh, runway right on the bay at Antoy. It's not there anymore, so you, you won't be able to see it on the map. And as I landed and taxied up, uh, he was standing on the ramp. And he walked up to the plane, and the first thing he said, he said, where are your rocket tubes? And I said, well, sir, I thought we were just out here to give you rides. He said, I think he said, get your ass back to Sock Trang and get some rocket tubes on this airplane. So I turned around and flew back to Sock Trang and told, it, told my CO that this guy wanted rocket tubes. And he mounted them on there, and I flew back. And when I landed... Back, back at Antoy, taxi on the ramp, there was a pallet completely full of rock boxes of rockets, and they were all HE, 17-pound HEs. And he said, uh, we, so he and me and my crew chief, when I went out there, I took a crew chief with me. It was an E-5, I think, a spec, spec 5. And he and I and the Spec 5, we broke the boxes apart, took the rockets out, screwed the warheads on, put the fuses on, and stuck in all these rockets into a Connex container. And he says, okay, load up. We're going to go hunting. And so we loaded some rockets in, and I took off, and he and I flew up to the north end of the island. It's... Uh, it's about 35 miles, and there is a free fire zone up there. And all that area is supposed to be infested with VC. So he said, okay, find me a target. And so we found an old sand pan laying in a little stream. And he said, okay, line me up. I want to shoot, start shooting rockets. So he wanted to fly this airplane from the back seat. And he told me, he'd tell me when to pull the trigger, because he didn't have a trigger on his stick. Yeah. So he would line up the airplane and he said, shoot, and I would pull the trigger. And so we did that for most of a month. And he liked to fly low level right down on the water and fly all the way around the island, which took about 45 minutes. But uh, he loved just to fly around. And so I had to do that for two months. And during that time, when I think we shot every one of those rockets at various things up on, on the <laughs> north end. And I don't think we hit a damn thing because I couldn't hit, I couldn't hit anything from 1,500 feet, and I wasn't about to go up there in that desolate, full jungle-covered uh, island and fly at low level, just so we could, just so we could play. And that's all he wanted to do. So when I, after leaving Canto, or I mean, sorry, the uh, Fukuoka Island, and went back. He said, I want you to take an airplane uh, and take it out to Chilang and, and fly for B-43, one of his B teams, exclusively because it was the farthest one away from Canto. 
and they were getting the most action. So he wanted me to be closer to the action. Uh, and so I, I built, uh, took my crew chief, as many tools as I could fit in the airplane. We flew out to uh, Chilang and established a place to store the airplane, which was right in a revetment right next to the runway. I went in to meet the commanding officer of the uh, B team, who was a light colonel at the time, a lieutenant colonel and introduced myself and he told me in no uncertain terms what he expected me to do. And that was, he, he wanted me to cover operations, ground operations. He wanted me to do intensive visual reconnaissance and he wanted me to be able to do close air support uh, when I was flying, uh, covering his operations because we were so far away from Canto where there was any artillery and there was any uh, uh, helicopter gunships that I could call in, that by the time they got to where the, 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 the ammunition was needed, then it was too late. So he wanted me to be able to do cross air support immediately if, if his people on the ground were, came in contact with the enemy. So I was obliged to carry as much armament as I could and we could only carry four on each wing. Plus I carried a, an M79 grenade launcher, 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Okay. And of course, a, a, a CAR-15 assault rifle. Well, the grenade launcher, it was never good as a tactical weapon, but it was good in doing what we called recon by fire, which means if you saw what something you suspected as an enemy, you could, punch a, a round down there and watch it detonate and see if that stirred up any any response. If the guys turn around and shot at you, then they assumed that you found them and then they were gonna start shooting. So that's why we call it recon by fire. I did that a lot also with a regular CAR-15 rifle where you could fire a whole magazine in about two, uh, two uh, one and a half seconds, you could fire 20 rounds in full automatic, and and you could literally aim it at the target. And they had uh, actually tracer rounds that I could fire with if I needed to. But basically, it was just to do recon because it wasn't really a very effective at killing anybody from from that altitude. And the M79, it has a very slow velocity round, mm -hmm. and my technique was to just lay it across my lap, point it out the window, straight out underneath the wing. And then I would fly at the target that I expected to hit. And I would fly off, say, maybe 400 meters one side. And I would wait until the target was down at an angle of maybe 45 degrees. And then I would pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. And the round would go out. And it was going forward because the airplane was going forward. And it was going sideways because it was shooting directly uh, 90 degrees to the airplanes uh, where it was pointed. So it was going to go in, down, and down, and forward, and forward. And if you watched carefully, you could see it, it detonate. It has, it, it has an explosive power of a, of a hand grenade, and that's about it. And since there's no smoke from it, the only indication that it went off as you see the dust kick up, dust from the, the, the round hitting. And you had to be very careful not to hit the strut of the airplane yeah. when you were shooting because you're shooting straight out underneath the wing. So that was my technique to shoot through. So the colonel, like, like I say, he told me what he wanted. He expected me to, to launch an airplane every morning, what he called the... Uh, the uh, first light mission, which means we were to take off literally when it was just enough light where you could see the runway. And we never turned the lights on. There was no lights on the runway and we never turned the lights on on the airplane because as soon as we did, we would start getting incoming mortar and rocket fire from the mountain. It was right next to the runway. And uh, so, uh, since there was just one, initially there was just me 
uh, doing all these missions. And I would fly out usually to one of the A teams and land, pick up their people, take them for a flight, do a visual reconnaissance, and then fly home. I would I would be back about noon, so I'd have lunch and do a, a, do it again. Fly out to a different team, pick up their people, fly them around. Each of the A teams had a 105 howitzer. <laughs> And uh, on one of the missions, I recall, we had a, a program where they had these, uh, I can't remember the name, but essentially they were listening devices that they could put out someplace. And if somebody walked by, the listening devices would transmit on a certain signal, which they could pick up back at the team. And that, that told them that there were people moving around. Well, these things would float. So they would put them out on the canals around the bit, around the team and float them in a position. So I would get with the commanding officer and he would tell me where these things are located on the map. So I would go out and I would adjust our, to his artillery fire until it was it was hitting close to where the spot was that he told me where the listening device was. Oh, very smart. Okay. So, so at later then at night, they had a list of where all these these things were, and they knew what information to put on the gun to shoot. Well, wow. so they would land right on top of where the listening device was. So all all it would take is if a sandpan came down a, a, a stream. Just the waves from the from the water would set off this listening device. And they would go out and they would put the information on the gun, put a round in and fire it, and hopefully hit the hit the target. Okay. And so I would I would do it. That that was a, a mission that I did several times. Uh, I also did uh, bomb damage assessment. Mm -hmm. Quite often we knew when there was going to be uh, uh, bombs. A drop by say B-52. I think I I sent you a picture of a B-52 strike. And uh, so uh, when those strikes went in, if they happen to have, a, yeah, there's a there it is. So you can see there's uh, in the dots, white dots. There's probably 315 bombs hit. And that mountain that are hidden is called Nuikam. That's the biggest of the seven mountains in the seven mountains area. And the runway was right at the, the base uh, of that mountain on this side. So you can see those bombs were landing about a mile from where my airplanes were parked. Now this was taken from a, a camp about a mile and a half away from where this strike went in. So anyway, when they would they would put one of these strikes in. They would want somebody to go in afterwards and look and see how much damage. And that's what they call a bond damage assessment. And I did a number of those. And uh, that that strike, by the way, right after that happened, we took a prisoner, a VC prisoner, who had been on that mountain at night. And I, I was there at the interrogation, and they asked him how many soldiers, how many enemy soldiers, or his his comp companions were killed by the B-52 strike. And he didn't even know that there had been a strike because he was so far inside that mountain in the caves that uh, he didn't even hear it. Oh. So that was a waste of several million dollars worth of ordnance that Basically, all we did was blow the trees apart, but we didn't kill anybody. But at that time, did you know that the VC was uh, living down there in tunnels? Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, in one of the mountains called Nui Koto, which was right south of this, the mountain you showed, it was called Nui Kam. Nui, N-U-I, is a Vietnamese word for mountain. So the second word... Kam or Kodo or Jai, those are the names of the mountains. So it was Mountain Nui Kodo. Okay. Nui Kodo uh, had, mount, had caves in it that were as big as gymnasiums. 
And uh, one, of, one of my good friends at the C team was a uh, construction engineer, uh, a captain. And after we took the mountain, I guess it was in the spring of 69, he had gone into the caves and said that he went into one cave that nothing less than a nuclear weapon would be able to blow it up. So the idea of trying to destroy it was just not possible. So we knew that the VC were using them, but there was nothing we could do to, uh, to stop it. Maybe you can comment this video. Yeah, this, uh, this was up in a little stretch of mountains right next to the Vente Canal. Uh, and I think I'm, you see those are rockets with VT fuses. You see the white little white dome. So we're, we're north of Chi Lang, uh, about a half a mile from the Vente Canal. And the Vente Canal in this part of, the, of Vietnam is the separation between Cambodia and Vietnam. It, the Vente Canal runs from Chao Phu or Chao Duc on the on the Bosak River all the way to Chi, to Ha Tien, which is a distance of about 50 miles. Now this place right here was where I always would get enemy fire from, and uh, I didn't like being there. So this mission was one that I flew with one of my warrant officer other pilots. Uh, and we would fly one mission, one aircraft high and one lower. And we flew out across, across an area called the Tram, which was a free fire zone. There was nothing out there besides low forest and canals. And the the only occasionally you would see that's that's looking back at the th three mountains or the seven mountains. And you see how the, the whole tram is flooded here. Now the tram was about 50 miles long and 30 miles wide. And the only people that would go out there was either enemy or civilians trying to cut wood, which they would cut wood and make uh, charcoal, which they use for, for, uh, for cooking. So we're out there looking and we spotted a, uh, a bunker and this is uh, the other pilot going in for a rocket run on this bunker. And when he shot, all he did was blow away the, the debris on top of the bunker, which was there to camouflage it. And uh, so when, once he got done firing, and there's one or two other rocket runs here, then I went in and I got too low. Well, this this particular run, this is him again shooting. But he was only about 150 feet above the trees right there when he pulled out. And after this run, he went up and watched as I went down. And I got a little bit too low and fired the rocket right into the door of the bunker. And it had the big secondary explosion. Well, this was right after it happened. And the guy in the back seat was taking a picture of me looking forward and at this time I was looking or he was looking at my aircraft because when I went down and had the secondary explosion something hit the bottom of my airplane and I thought or I thought it hit the bottom of the airplane and it hit very hard so I flew back and landed and to check the airplane and I jumped out and looked underneath and couldn't find anything wrong my uh Crew chief says, what's going on? I said, I something hit the bottom of the airplane. Well, he looked up and the right wing was crushed in. The leading edge of the right wing was crushed in. Uh, which So whatever hit me came past the airplane right outside of where the propeller arc was and hit the right wing and mashed it in for a distance of about three feet. Oh. And uh, that really scared me. I decided I was never going to you know, attack and go that low again, but uh, of course I did. Uh, <laughs> I, I did it lots of times, but uh, yeah, the uh, uh, the thing about out there, there was there was very few bad guys, and when they were there, they didn't shoot at you because they didn't want to get spotted. 
So if we saw something that we knew for exactly uh, for sure it was enemy, like the bunker, uh, then we attacked it. Otherwise, we would not shoot at anybody that we couldn't positively identify as being an enemy. Okay. So interesting. It's so amazing because you flew the bird to like a fighter plane, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You I haven't actually... been taught in, in Fort Rock, Alabama to fly the bird like this. No, no, they didn't teach you things like that. The you know, we were we were supposed to even the in country, the, the SOP, the standard procedure was to uh start your, your dive at fifteen hundred, shoot and pull out by a thousand feet. And don't put yourself at in that much jeopardy but like i was saying before you just can't be a short of a hit from that distance or that yeah. altitude so you you attacked as down as close as you need to be and and that for me was 100 feet there were many times when i was uh, covering an operation where the special forces were down there and they would get uh uh in contact with an enemy patrol and be under heavy fire where I was able to see maybe a, a, a crew serve weapon, an automatic weapon firing at them that I, I went right down within a hundred feet and fired and tried to destroy or at least silence the weapon long enough where my guys could get their, their themselves out of harm's way. So you did what was necessary and uh, I know you asked the question, how you deal with the idea that people are shooting at you. Mm. Uh, and I, I, quite honestly, I didn't even think very often about that. Uh, it was just a job to do. And like you suggested, I felt that I was invincible. You know, my, my dad told me when he was in the Navy that he saw a ship uh, uh, explode. Uh, a destroyer that was escorting his uh, aircraft carrier and the destroyer had hit a mine and blew the whole front off the ship and the propellers still producing thrust just drove the ship straight under the water and everybody on the whole ship perished. And it, and, and it happened within a matter of seconds and he always said he knew that he would make it home to his wife and his children. That if everybody except one was killed on the ship, he would be the one that would survive. And that's kind of how I felt when I was in Vietnam. And uh, up until the last week that I was there. And then I got the shakes. And I didn't I yeah. didn't want I didn't want to fly missions at all. And I definitely didn't fly under a thousand feet. Um, as I remember the last, very last mission that I flew, it was the morning that I left Chi Lang to fly back to Sok Trang uh, to get processed out of the out of the company. And that morning, I took off on a mission in the dark and came home and landed uh, in a mid morning. And it was a total waste of a mission. I, I couldn't, I didn't have the courage to look down. I didn't have the courage, to, like I normally would do is just open the window, sit with my my elbow on the, on the window and look down where there was nothing between me and an enemy gun except space. That morning, I didn't have the courage to look out the window. And if I was in an area that I thought that I would get some enemy fire. I would just bank away because I knew I was sitting on an armor seat. I had a flak vest on. And so I just went up there and I bored holes for two and a half, three hours. And then I landed. Thank God that I had survived. And uh, uh, then when I, when I landed, uh, my crew chief ran up to the side of the airplane and he said that somebody at Sock Trang had called and that I was to get back there as soon as possible because I was going to, I was supposed to leave the next morning. And so I, I packed up, uh, 
got my things, put them in the airplane and, and took off. Flew a, an hour long flight back to Sok Trang and landed at Sok Trang and uh, said goodbye to my, my baby, my airplane. Went in and, and checked out of the company, turned in all the stuff I was I had that I needed to leave there. And Dave McGowan was there. And uh, they one of their pilots, or one of the other shotgun pilots, who got in the company Beaver, and uh, he flew us to Saigon. Mm -hmm. And I think it was about six o'clock the next morning when Dave and I walked up the ramp into the DC-8 and flew home. And that was the end of it. But uh, very intense that last day was not a good one. Yeah. You know, there were times during that last month when I couldn't sleep at night. Hmm. And I would, I stood, I had a, at that time, we had moved to this new compound and I lived in a, uh, a concrete block building. I had a large room by myself and there was a door and there was a window with metal shutters. And I thought maybe I could hear people coming, moving around outside. So I would stand there in the dark with my CRR 15 in my hands, peeking through the shutters to see if there was any enemy walking around in the compound. And uh, uh, so I, I didn't get much sleep those days. And, uh, but anyway, one day after another until I, the final day and that, that final morning I got up and I told myself, once I land after this mission, I am going to go back to Sock Trang whether they're expecting me or not. And I'm going to get the hell out of this country once and for all. Because ordinarily, pilots were supposed to stop flying about a week before the time that they left country. Because they were in the same position I was. They were scared to death. Uh, you had on the on the cowling, on the top of the cowling, there was a little stick. Did, yeah. did you also use this? Anyway, that, that little rod was dead center in the middle of the airplane. Yeah. That sticks up, and my but normal it was, sitting. It was for aiming, or that's what the intent was. Okay. A lot of people would tie a string to it, sort of mm -hmm. like the the string on the front of a glider. You, you can tell if you're 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 slipping. And uh. but but I never I never use that because my normal sit position was a little bit left of center, so I could put my left my my left arm on the sill, the window sill. <laughs> and almost flew all the time with the window open. And I'm sitting there like this. So I'm I'm looking out a little bit off center. So when I put the my grease pencil mark was a little bit off center. So in my normal sitting position, if if I wasn't turning uh, at all and I put that that grease pencil mark on the target. I was almost always in perfect trim, and all I had to do was just glance for a second at the turn and slip indicator. And if if it wasn't, if I wasn't slipping at all, then I would pull the tr trigger. I mean, if the ball was in the center, mm -hmm. in the center, and because uh, that really makes a difference. From a thousand feet, you can miss the target by fifty yards if if you're slip if the airplane is slipping a little bit, because it'll the rocket will go out and it'll turn into the relative wind. And, uh, so you might as well not have even shot, but but uh, after I think after a while, most of the pilots didn't even think about the turn and slip because they had flown the airplane so much, they were so familiar with it that it just became second nature. And uh, but uh, early on, when you first tried to do that, you needed to take advantage of every everything you had and and looking at the turn and slip and was, was one of the things that you had to do if you expected to hit the target. Do you have any idea how much rocket you have shot? Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I think I flew uh, 280 or more than that, probably 290, 300 missions. And uh, once established at Chilang, 
which was the last nine months of my tour, I probably fired at least one rocket every time I took off. And usually if I fired one, I fired all eight of them and at something. Uh, and uh, Think about that. Was, that. That could be more than a thousand rockets. That's a, that's a bunch of them. Amazing. And almost all of them were HE. You know, later in the, in the war, later in the year, it, they introduced the flechette warheads. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know they each each of the cylinder each rock warhead has a, I think five thousand flechettes in it. They're about about that long, and uh, they are swedged on the end like a like a nail head. In fact, they look like a nail if you didn't if you didn't account for the fins on the back, which are swedged into place. And when they're packed. In the warhead, they're packed nose tail like this, and they put they're standing on edge, and they they make a cylinder that is you know, as long as the the nail, and they're all packed in there. And there's probably I don't know maybe a, a 500 of them in a pack, and they're all stuck head to t head to tail, and they're stuck together with some kind of a shellac that holds them together. The warhead comes out at such an acceleration that it compresses a spring in the fuse. And then as soon as the rocket motor burns out, the spring shoves forward, detonates the charge, and it blows all the nails out of the front of the tube. And then the powder, of course. And since they're shocked when they come out, they just blast away into pellets, almost like shooting a shotgun. Well. And and that in the puff of red powder tells the gunner where where his rounds detonated. Now they they only accelerate for, I think for 1.3 seconds, and they and in 1.3 seconds they sell they accelerate to about 500 knots. From so you add 100 knots airspeed plus 500. You know the, these nails are going five or 600 knots, and if you if you start firing them and you're a long way from the target, they will slow down very quickly and spread out. And you get a very dispersed pattern, like shooting a long distance with a shotgun. Same idea. You could see them from the ground. You could see the rocket come out in a little puff of, puff of powder. And you knew that uh, the ground was being saturated with these, these little nails. And if, if they were still going at four or three or four hundred knots, you know, one of those would penetrate right into the steel barrel of a, of a rifle. And if they hit a human, you know, they would go deep into an arm, maybe not all the way through. Uh, I don't think they would go all through all the way through a bone. But, you know, if the guy was hit by two or three pellets or these things, he was pretty much incapacitated. Yeah, yeah and, uh, for sure. You know, I think probably the uh, Geneva Convention would have frowned on us using that, but at that time in the war, we were using everything we could to, to stop the enemy. <laughs> oh, one of my favorite pictures. Yeah, Hedgeen, also mine. This picture is incredible. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, yeah. You can uh, see, I don't know if you notice, right above my left hand, you can see a little dark shadow about yeah. halfway between. That's that's a brass piece of brass flying out that the camera happened to catch. So I was on full automatic. And at full auto, the, the, the gun shoots about 1,100 rounds per minute. So it'll empty a magazine in about one and a half seconds. There were two magazines. They were taped together. And then I had a pouch that hung on the back of the front seat, and it had seven magazines. Oh, okay, really? Well, wow. and then and then I usually had uh, in my vest. You can't see it here. There's a there's a flak vest, which is the light brown thing that I'm mm. wearing. Uh, but I had also a survival vest, and it had some pockets in it, and I would carry a couple of magazines in there as well. So you also flew with. No mix. Yeah, this was later. Uh, this was a no mix flight suit. 
they were two piece. I didn't like them. They were hot. They didn't look very good. I much rather flew in uh, what we call jungle fatigues. Mm -hmm. The air, you know, the picture. Uh, there's a picture of me standing in front of the aircraft, uh, and that picture shows the normal jungle fatigues, which were much lighter. They were uh, cooler, and they looked good, and uh, I much preferred them. Do you mean this year or? Yeah, that's that picture. That's that's called jungle fatigue. You see, they're large pockets. Yeah. Um, and they they were a nice looking uniform, and this is what I flew almost all the time. I didn't like the Nomex at all. But you had to fly with the sleeves down. Uh, the only time I put the sleeves down is when I would start to fly uh, or shoot rockets, and I would roll my sleeves down because the. And I closed the, the windows, of course. But I remember one day I, I made the mistake of firing a rocket with the, uh, you know, see, that's jungle fatigues. That's what I usually flew in. Mm -hmm. And you see how short the weapon is. That's It's it's not as long as a normal M16 rifle. It's the same caliber, same firing mechanism, but it's only, it's only about 24 inches long. And it has a collapsible stock. And it was much easier to carry on the airplane than a normal M16 rifle would be. But, uh, I want I, I, I meant to tell you something. You know, we when I saw those uh, aviation uh, that refueling station, we used uh, 115, 145 aviation gas there. Mm -hmm. Very high octane, very high amount of lead in it. And the reason uh, early in the war. Uh, when President Kennedy was still president of the United States, he had coerced uh, Robert McNamara, who was at the, at the time the head of the Ford Motor Company, to be his Secretary of Defense. Well, McNamara was a was a genius. The guy had been a light colonel, I think it was a light colonel in the Second World War, and actually had assisted Curtis LeMay in the destruction of Japanese cities in the latter parts of the Second World War. And he was an efficiency expert. And when he became Secretary of Defense, he evidently couldn't understand why the, the Air Force and the Army needed four different types of aviation gas, starting all the way from 887 up to 115, 145. And since the one, the big, you know, the big uh, Air Force aircraft with big re uh, reciprocating radial engines needed that high octane fuel, so he decided that everybody could use that as well. Well, it, it contains very high concentrations of tetraethyl lead in it, and that simply doesn't work very good in low uh, compression engines like we had in the Bird Dog. So we had a lot of uh, fouling of the spark plugs, mm -hmm. and uh, also it got into the behind the piston rings, caused problems there. So it was very common for us to lose, uh, have high mag drops because of fouled plugs, and often from the time you you started the engine after it say after it came in from a flight, you taxied up and shut down. And then you subsequently started the engine to taxi out to take off. In that amount of time, you would foul out a plug. So when you found that out in the mag drop test, you know, the, the mag check. So you taxi back and let it cool. And the, the, uh, the crew chiefs would get out their grease pencils and start marking the exhaust stacks so that they could tell, you know, which cylinder had the mag or uh, the bad plug. But on several occasions, I think three times, I had to make precautionary landings because both cylinder, both plugs on the same cylinder had shorted out, which causes the engine to violent. You, you probably oh, experienced it. Shakes yeah. like the devil. But uh, you know, the issue was back then there wasn't any low lead aviation gasoline. All yeah. of it had high concentrations of lead. And so we had to use, uh, thanks to McNamara's uh, uh, mandate of only using high octane gas, we had to deal with that. And it caused us some issue. The same with the oil. It was not a very good quality oil. 
not nearly as good as the, the aviation oils we have now with the additives that keep the, the engine front and clean. So we had to deal with that. So getting a thousand hours out of the of an engine just was not on the cards. You usually went through a, 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 an engine in four or five hundred hours to the point oh, where oh, that's yeah, slow. before yeah. That was so to think that we always had a perfectly running engine and all the maintenance was great is not the case. The maintenance was great, but the fuel and the oil was not great and, and the conditions. I had my crew chief change oil every four flying hours and they changed the air screen every flight. They put a new air screen on every flight because we, when we taxied out, it would be very dusty. And, uh, and we didn't want that getting into the engine. So I tried my best to, to get as many hours as I could out of these engines, but it just didn't work out that way. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, we will do two or three final questions. Okay. How was your homecoming? No. Uh, I came home in the middle of the night, and I landed at uh, Travis Air Force Base near Oakland, California. And I was in uniform. I was in an Army 10 uniform that I had made because I was so thin. I had, when I went to Vietnam, I weighed 170 pounds and I was 140 pounds, you know, 70 kilos coming back. So okay. I had made a, a, a new, I had a, got a new uniform made. So I landed uh, at Travis, it was the middle of the night. I walked around, there wasn't a soul in the airfield. Uh, or in the air, airfield. So I got a taxi and I took a taxi over to San Francisco International Airport. And I thought they would have a flight going to Portland, which is only, you know, right up the coast, about an hour and a half flight. But there wasn't a soul on that air, airport either. It was completely deserted. So I walked in and I lay down on a bench and I went to sleep. And uh, with my duffel bag, uh, full of my gear next to me. And when I woke up, the place was just buzzing with activity. Well, I had sat down right adjacent to a, a United Airlines ticket counter. And I walked over and said, how's the fastest way you can get me to Portland? And she put me on the first flight. And I landed, my wife my and my uh, dad and mother and my brother were waiting. Great. And because my my after after my mother my wife had uh, taken care of her mother, you know she was in Spokane, Washington. Her mother had died oh. while I was there. So she so my wife moved in with my parents for the last few months that I was over there. So she was in Portland area. And so we had this wonderful homecoming. And as we drove down the street to my house, our, our house is a big uh, multi-story with big columns out front. It was all painted white. And it's right at the end of the street. And on the front of the house, there was a banner that says, Welcome Home, Gene. So it was a wonderful, wonderful homecoming. But... During the time when I was there, the only thing that we listened to as far as media was AFVN, American Forces Vietnam Network, and never heard anything about protests going on back in the States. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we got, uh, we got the newspaper American Forces newspaper, and hardly anything about those type of protests. So I didn't even realize they were happening. Mm -hmm. But no one ever approached me. Even the morning I woke up, you know, after landing and going over to San Francisco, even as I woke up and the place was just busy, there was no one giving me a problem. But had there been, and somebody walked up and swore at me or spit on me, there would have been a war yeah. between me and them. 
Yeah. Believe me, because I was in no mood to put up with any crap like that. Yeah. But I knew a lot of soldiers who had to put up with that. And these were other officers, you know, pilots that I met after I, you know, I got back to, uh, got to Germany and, and all the pilots kind of uh, got together and talked. And there were a few that had, had uh, situations where they were, they were spit on and swore at and, but uh, it didn't happen to me. I really do everything to keep your stories alive. You know, I do 12, 15 air shows a year across Europe, Italy, uh, Austria, Germany, Switzerland. And uh, I have two sheets. Uh, and the spectator always uh, tells the, the crowd uh, about the bird dog while, while I'm flying. And after my display, people come to me and say, really? Those guys flew with with such a little plane in Vietnam, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, sometimes there are 30, 40 people around me and asking me questions about the bird dog and about the bravery of you guys because they can't believe that there are no armor plates or something, that it's just thin aluminium. Yeah. And uh, this is the way that I try to keep your stories alive. Yeah. Well, I mean, all those guys who, who were there uh, owe you a, a deep debt of gratitude for keeping them, keeping them yeah. alive. Because, you know, when we die, everybody's going to forget that it even happened. Yeah. And, but for, you know, it was interesting that the video that I sent you, mm -hmm. I have copy of it on a DVD mm -hmm. and at Fort Rucker, Alabama, there is a, there is a, uh, a museum, an army aviation museum. Mm -hmm. And out in front of that museum, there is a, a monument that has 11 facets on the front. And on each facet is the information about a particular unit that was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Okay. Inside that monument, there is a time capsule. And inside that com capsule is a copy of that DVD. Hey. Okay. Cool. Year, Very cool. Years, years ago, when I, when I first showed that, that video to a reunion that I went to from my old unit in Vietnam. I showed it to them and the guy in in our unit that was called upon to donate or, or raise money to build that monument, they asked him, you know, each each unit needs to put something into the time capsule that is most meaningful for them. Mm. And that man came to me, he said, would you agree to put a copy of the DVD or the bird dog video in the time capsule? And I said, absolutely. So okay. it's there. Now, whether people a hundred years from now or however, open that up, whether they can actually watch it or there's any kind of a device where they could use to watch it, I don't know. But I was deeply honored when they asked me if, yeah. if they could have a copy of the DVD to put in that time capsule. I hope you have a long career with yours and, and also your son. And, Thank you, uh, sir. Fly safe and and uh, someday when I get to Austria, I'll look you up and yeah, be my guest. And go have some beer and, and talk yeah. about airplanes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Gene, you're a great person. Uh, Thank you. Stay healthy. And uh, it would be wonderful if we could stay in touch. Okay, I definitely will. Take care, my friend. Thank you. Okay, have a nice day. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, wasn't that a cool interview with Gene? And especially speaking about all those details, fuel, oil, engine, maintenance, and the warheads. I didn't know all those informations about the warheads. If you liked this interview, please share a comment below. Like and subscribe this channel and thanks for watching.